Okay, welcome to everybody. I hope you enjoyed that little uh, introduction there by the dive travel team, the South African based outfit. And um, yeah, a bunch of youngsters uh, enjoying diving and taking people on trips. So yeah, have a look at their website and connect with them if you like. Gareth, nice to have you uh, join yet another Dan broadcast and uh, presentation from you. Thanks so much, Mornay. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's great to see some of the, the early birds in the chat window. So um, yes. let us know where you are. That's awesome because I want you also, you're going to be engaging with a keyboard or your uh, your phone uh, later on this. So I want to make sure that everything's working there. So Okay. All right. Well, there you go. I hope you guys are prepared. So uh, from my side, I think I'll just start the general introductions. And while we wait for more folks to join, so we can get that over with and uh, jump into the exciting part, which is your presentation. So uh, let me just get this sorted on my end. Okay. All right, seems to be okay. All right, let me just do this. All right. Well, here we go. To all the early birds and folks that have just joined, welcome, Dive Nation. Great to have you join yet another Supercharged Dan webinar. My name is Mornay Christo. I'm the host this evening, and I'm also the CEO of Divers Alert Network Southern Africa. Thank you for making the time to join our webinar. I really appreciate it. And thank you for supporting Divers Alert Network, which helps to build safer dive communities. Now, the talk topic this evening, really looking forward to it as usual, but in particular tonight, it is the diver's dilemma, balancing risk and reward, the reality. So before we get into that, just a couple of webinar basics, you know, your uh, video and your mic is turned off. If you have any comments, uh, you can use the comments box, introduce yourself, tell us where you are in the world, and also let us know what expectations you have for uh, the presentation. Now, during the talk, if you have any questions, please use the comments box with hashtag asked followed by your question, and we'll pick it up from there and do our best to answer any questions that you have. As usual, the replay will be available tomorrow via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel. You'll also receive an email with a replay link and a whole bunch of free resources uh, from Dan and Gareth's side as well. So keep a lookout for, um, uh, yeah, for that uh, email. All right. So again, just thank you for supporting Divers Alert Network. If you haven't joined yet, why not join today? If you're in the Southern Africa region, you can go to our website, and that's dansa.org. Uh, in the USA, you can go to dan.org. In Europe, it's daneurope.org. And in Asia Pacific, it's danap.org. And to all the Dan members, thank you for your ongoing support. And if any of you would like us to help grow our channel, why not consider donating via the YouTube Super Chat feature? It's usually situated to the left, right, above or below the comments box and a little icon, dollar sign. Uh, if you click on that, uh, you can decide to donate however much you want uh, in the form of a super sticker or to bump up any of your comments or questions. And if you do decide to do that, thank you very much for your support. Um, as usual, I have a free Dan gift for, uh, for you uh, joining the webinar this evening. It's another must-have Dan guide, and this time it's about the heart and diving. And if you'd like a copy of this, um, this guide, all you need to do is scan that QR code, and that'll open up your WhatsApp application with a pre-populated message just stating that you'd like a copy of the heart and diving guide. And all you need to do is then just add your... Um, uh, your name so that I know who I'm talking to, and I'll send you the download link. So for the folks that are still trying to get their phone sorted, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit. If you haven't uh, heard me yet, um, you can just scan that QR code. Uh, your WhatsApp application will open up a message, um, and um, all you need to do is just add your name in there, and I'll send you the download link. It's a really nice, bulky guide. I think you'll enjoy it. And what I've done is I've actually added a link to our YouTube uh, Heart and Diving um, uh, what's it, the playlist uh, with about, I don't know, 20 or 30 different videos in there. So uh, you can enjoy that as well. 
nice little bonus for you. All right, moving on. Uh, you're watching the broadcast via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button while you wait for us uh, to get the webinar started. And uh, it'll be great if you can actually share this with any of your other dive buddies that uh, aren't aware uh, of the, um, uh, the webinar this evening or just um, that you might think they'll enjoy this, you know, and uh, share that with them. After the presentation, if you enjoyed what uh, you heard and listened to, uh, why not hit that like or thumbs up button? That'll help us to, to boost this uh, presentation, um, you know, using the YouTube algorithms. Okay, let's see, what else do I have here? Uh, for those of you that don't know Gareth, uh, he has a quick uh, overview of who he is. He's been involved with uh, high-risk work since 1989, and he spent 25 years in the Royal Air Force in a variety of frontline operational research and development and systems engineering roles, which has given him a unique perspective. And in 2005, he started his diving training with GUI and is now an advanced trimix diver and a JJ CCR normoxic trimix diver. In uh, 2016, he formed the Human Diver with the goal of bringing his operational human factors and system thinking to diving safety. And since then, he has trained more than 350 people face-to-face -face around the globe, taught nearly 2,000 people via online programs, and sold more than 4,000 copies of his book, Under Pressure, Diving Deeper with Human Factors. And he also produced, if only, a documentary about a fatal dive told through the lens of human factors and a just culture. Now his goal uh, is to bring human factors, practice and knowledge into the diving community to improve safety, performance and enjoyment. All right, before I hand over to uh, Gareth, just a quick talk topic overview. Risk management is a key part of uh, the diving we do. And for instructors and those in supervisory position, positions, risk assessments on normal activities. Uh, the presentation will look at how risk and uncertainty are really uh, managed and give you a better idea on how to increase certainty in your diving, instruction, and supervision. Can't wait. Uh, so with that said, let's get started. And uh, Gareth, let me hand over to you. Uh, let me get out of this. Okay. okay. Getting there. <laughs> 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 it's, all, all right. it's all fun when we're trying to manage these things live yeah all right so let me remove that give hand over to you and maybe just do that yeah no that's, all that's right great. there we go all sorted over to you gareth uh no that's great Mornay. thank you very much for the introduction and, and again thank you for, for the opportunity to be here um those who've attended i think i've done five so far um yeah. I, I'm passionate about sharing this knowledge and, and I would really like you to sort of engage with questions, challenges in, in the chat window. Um, it's it, it's beneficial for me because I get some feedback and it's those who've never sort of presented like this before. Speaking to a camera is, is, is pretty hard. You just get used to it and, and you hope that people are listening at the other end. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk tonight, um, tonight for the UK anyway, um, about the way that we manage risk and uncertainty in diving. And I'm going to start with a story. But before I do, Samara, you said, why don't I have a pic? Have you got a picture now? Um, just respond there. Just to make sure that it's all, it should be all good. But I just uh, saw uh, that. Uh, I just want to make sure Samara okay. is happy with that. Why don't I have a pic? Mm. I think Not that sure might well. be over the, the bits. So, okay. um so the story I'm going to start with um, relates to this photo. And in this photo is a uh, my buddy. It's a guy called Howard. Uh, good, good friend. And we were finishing the week's worth of diving in Malta. And this is a wreck called the Schnell Boat. Uh, I think it's the S31 that sits in about 65 meters, so about 200 feet uh, in Malta. Uh, and that's mainly ambient light that's lighting this. It's fantastic wreck. Now, this dive was about 30 minutes of decur sorry, 30 minutes of bottom time at 65 meters. So we had about an hour's worth of decompression to do. So we 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 finished, we ascended, and, and we did the, the, the deco as planned. 
and which included a, about 30 minutes on oxygen at, at six meters, 20 feet. So we, we ascended, finished the dive, got on the boat and the, uh, as, as I took off, well, I, I sort of ruined the, the, the idea of the story now because I've compromised it, but there we go. That's what happens when you tell these stories. So the, the, the diver gets off, gets out the water and starts taking their kit off and they start getting some visual disturbances. And what happened is they, they didn't say anything. They, they didn't have any sort of signs and symptoms of decompression sickness, but, but something wasn't quite right. And so they, you know, they didn't say anything, the diver didn't say anything, and they got the kit ready, and they, they finished the dive, and they, they motored back into the quayside, which took about 30 minutes. And that, from research, is about the peak bubbling time after a decompression dive, or any dive, uh, is, is when you get the peak bubbling. And so after about 30 minutes or so, they got to the quayside and they started unloading all of the, uh, the cylinders. And, and for this dive, it was twin 80s on their back, uh, an 80 for bottom gas, and then two aluminium 70s for the, the 50 and 100%. Mm. So there was a lot of stuff to unload. And the diver in question, as they lifted the twin set from the quayside uh, up onto the, um, the flatbed, got some big visual disturbances. And in their um, their mind, they said, well, because they'd done some research in this, they they realized they got a PFO because these were sort of classic symptoms of what uh, a shunt would look like and what decompression would look like or decompression sickness would look like. But they didn't say anything to their buddy. They, um, they carried on. There was some disturbances and it took about 45 minutes to an hour before those visual disturbances died down. By which time they got back to the dive center, they were a little bit quiet, and then they flew home the following day. Um, now, if you haven't sort of picked up on this, well, I'd like you to chat and basically put something in the window and think, what are your thoughts about that diver who's had suspected decompression sickness, and then they've flown home the following day? They didn't go to a didn't go to a doctor, didn't go to a chamber. What are your thoughts? And you can use, you can chat away. And this is where we end up with a little bit of a delay with YouTube, yeah. which is about yeah. sort of five or six seconds and wait for people to, to put stuff in there. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that'd be fair. That'd be fair. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Colin. Yeah. Others, what what are others' thoughts about that diver who flew home the following day? Yep, mm -hmm. Philippe. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so the point when when I've um, uh, Jerome, yes, they probably mm. would. Um, and the, the point is, so Jacob, yes, risk is dependent on experience and knowledge, but even then it's, it's not a particularly bright idea to go flying the following day after suspected DCS. Now, mm. that, when I've done this in a, a physical environment, it's easier to get this point across because it's more timely because mm. what I say is that diver was me and it was, so Fiona, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, and, and the reason why I didn't say anything, A, I was in denial, and it's a really strong factor for, for DCS or uh, uh, symptom sign afterwards. But I was out there with my girlfriend, now wife at the time. We were flying home the following day. I knew if I'd said something that A, I was going to worry her. Uh, B, I would probably end up in a chamber. And um, it meant that we weren't going to be flying home the following day. And that was going to completely trash our holiday plans and things like that. So there is this bit that, that is also, I didn't have any sort of exterior signs and symptoms. I've got visual disturbances, but I didn't have any sort of skin mottling or, or anything else like that. And that was a sort of a, a confirmation bias that something, it, it wasn't what I thought it was. So I, I didn't have any other symptoms on, on the flight, which was good. Um, 
I then, when I got back to the to the UK, I phoned my technical diving instructor and I said, Rich, who's the cardiologist? Who's the, the specialist in Bristol who deals with PFOs? And he passed me the detail of that surgeon who I managed to get hold of and I spoke to. And and I explained the, you know, what had happened. And I said, look, it was it was a fairly conservative profile. And I won't say exactly what he said because of the, the audience that's here, but it basically it was an expletive and then said a bunch of guinea pigs. Technical divers are a bunch of guinea pigs. His background was naval military diving and where risk is managed. And, and they will take risks, definitely, but they would manage it in a, supervi a supervised way. And, you know, if, if it meant a long decompression, well, so be it. And, and we would extend that. And that, I think, is one of the challenges we face in the diving industry that, as Jakob said, risk is dependent on experience and knowledge. And it's our perception of the risk that is important. And I'll come on to that as we go through this presentation this evening. And I'd, I'd love and I'm really, you know, thank you for, for writing the stuff in the uh, in the chat window. Um, please carry on doing so. Um, this is a, 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 I suppose, a, a little poem that talks about risk. To try is to risk failure, but risks must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he cannot learn, feel, change, grow, or live. Chained by his servitude, he is a slave who has forfeited all freedom. Only a person who risks is free. The pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, and the realist adjusts the sails. Diving is a hazardous activity, and I've mentioned that hazardous rather than risk on, uh, on purpose, because risk is something slightly different. We are exposed to a hazardous environment when we go diving. Um, so the, um, the, the point moving on here is that there is a definition of risk, and the Royal Society in 1983, after spending years, put together a paper that defined it as the probability that a particular adverse event occurs during a stated period of time or results from a particular challenge. As a probability in the sense of statistical theory, risk obeys all the formal laws of combining probabilities. And then when they published it, they realized that actually this doesn't work because it works in sort of financial context. It works in sort of numerical stuff. We can start doing it in terms of systems, hardware failures. But when we start getting people involved, it doesn't quite work that way because risk means different things to different people. And that's really what this slide is all about. So we've got risk as a hazard. So which risks should we rank? What, what are the ones that we need to address and prioritize? Um, and that might be about um, exposure, time, um, decompression sickness, equipment failure, risk as a probability. What's the risk of me having a PFO, uh, patent foramen, foramen, sorry, uh, foramen ovale, uh, which is a hole in the heart, which is what I got diagnosed with when I spoke to that doctor. Um, I went in after, you know, I got back on the Monday, spoke to him on the Wednesday, the following week, I'd had a transthoracic echocardiogram and found out that I had an eight millimeter by 12 millimeter hole in my heart. And it didn't show when I did a normal Valsalva, but it did when I did something he called a builder's snip, a big pressure change in the heart. And he injected bubbles into my veins. I sniffed and I've got a nice little video that goes did -dum, did -dum, did -dum, did -dum, as, as, as the bubbles go through. So, the, the, um, so the probability for having a PFO while you're a, a diver is in the order of 20, 20 to 25%. A quarter to a fifth of people have a PFO in the standard population. Now, risk as a consequence. Well, what's the risk of not analyzing my gas? Well, it could be hypoxia. It could be uh, oxygen toxicity, hyperoxia, or it could be a decompression issue that, that deals with that. It could be a risk, sorry, it could be an adversity, adversity or a threat. So how great is the risk of getting decompression sickness? That's a real wet finger in the air, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. 
And the other piece then is it's context specific. And that's the um, the point that Jakob's making. All diving involves risk. How we approach the risk mitigation is based on a point of view or perception. Now, the reason why you can be context specific is because if you think about ice on a pavement, which is probably not an issue you ever get in South Africa, but you know, for, for kids, having ice on the pavement is great because that gives you an opportunity to go slip sliding and brilliant. But to an old person, it could be fatal if there's a slip, broken hip, and major injury that happens. The same thing for diving is, you know, we, we end up in a, a fantastic environment where we can see shipwrecks that have been down there for hundreds of years or the sea life that is down there. But at the same time, if we get it wrong, we're in a dangerous situation. So it's about the perception and the acceptance that we need to deal with that, that's, that's important when it comes to risk management. Now, one of the, the, the speakers that I love and, and I talk about a lot is a guy called Todd Conklin. And this is one of his sort of you know, phrases or quotes that I, I present a lot of the times. Safety is not just the absence of accidents or incidents, but rather the presence of barriers and defenses and the capacity or the ability of the system to fail safely. So what does that mean? So what we're talking about here, barriers and defenses, is the stuff beforehand. What we're talking about is prevention at this stage. So designing uh, diving equipment to be safe to operate, to be easy to operate, to easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. The technical skills that we acquire during training courses or coaching sessions or development as we go through diving, and that could be buoyancy, trim, propulsion, using a, uh, a rebreather. It could be about putting a, a marker buoy up or laying line or photogrammetry. All of those are technical skills that help us reduce the likelihood of an adverse event. Then we end up with non-technical skills. And if you've seen a presentation before of mine, we talk about outcomes being a function of a number of areas. And one of those is, is non-technical skills, which is a subset of human fact, excuse me, human factors. Human factors is huge. Non-technical skills is about decision making, situation awareness, teamwork, leadership, um, uh, followership and performance shaping factors. It's our attitude that goes into this to say, actually, we've got a questioning attitude. It's not about being paranoid. It's about understanding that things will go wrong. How do we go about spotting those? And then all of that is encompassed through knowledge and experience. And it's diverse experience. I wrote a blog just recently about why experts may not be great instructors because they've got you know, a, a very different way of thinking about solving problems. But that solving problems is, is fantastic. It helps us identify what's going on. So we've got the barriers and defenses before the, sorry, yeah, the barriers and defenses before an adverse event. We also then have that capacity to fail safely. So how do we manage that? Again, we go back to the non-technical skills and human factors. It's about teamwork, about leadership, about effective decision making, about understanding our ability to notice stuff. So that's, you know, you go back to another presentation I did about situation awareness. It's about a thinking about the contingencies and the emergency procedures. So bailout or contingencies, making sure you practice those regularly. You know, the number of people that I speak to who are on rebreathers, and the last time they did a live bailout was on their training course a couple of years ago. That is not going to help you when the proverbial hits the fan and you have to make decisions quickly. Um, medical kit is another way of failing safely. And that could be uh, first aid kits. It could be oxygen. It could be, um, uh, I'm just thinking of the devices that you use, AEDs for, uh, for cardiac arrest. Um, all of that helps us recover a situation and not end up in a catastrophic failure. Um, we've also got emergency drills and training going about practicing these things. Um, I often joke about people that they used to run, you know, doing an air sharing drill, kneeling on the bottom and facing each other. Well, how often do people run out of gas kneeling on the bottom facing each other? It's probably pretty rare. So we've got to get into the, the habit and, and the techniques and the skills associated with dealing with emergency drills in real time. And then the final piece is about uh, insurance and life assurance. And that is not necessarily to protect you. It's actually to make sure that your families are left 
with a with a, a safe outcome. Um, sweeping generalization, a large number of technical divers are male, older side of middle age, and probably the breadwinners for their families. And if they die, then a lot of the, the sort of perception is that the litigation happens because there's no income coming in. So I will cover right at the end of this presentation a piece about life assurance. And I get this pushback and say, yeah, but they might not pay out. Well, I can tell you what, they will never pay out if you don't have policies in place. So moving into then perceived risks, what do we think is risky? And this is from a, a paper written, well, it's what, 30, 30 something years ago, talking about the perception of risk by posed by extreme events. And they went to four different groups of people and, and asked them, you know, there are 30 activities. This is just the top end of the table. Um, and they asked, you know, what's the, the riskiest activity that goes on? Now, interestingly, for the, the naive people, um, they thought nuclear power was the riskiest thing that was going out there. And, and the experts put it way down there because it's heavily managed. It's There's lots of technology and skills goes into ensuring that you don't have a catastrophic event. Now, interestingly, motor vehicles are way up there. And, and it's this bit that, you know, the risk of dying and on a dive is about one in 200,000 dives. Um, so statistically, diving is pretty safe. You're more likely to get injured or killed driving to the dive site than you are when you are actually on the dive in, in the general way. So we've got to look at how we perceive that. And as an example, my I did I had a marketing coach a little while ago who went to learn to dive out in the Caribbean and um, did her sessions in the back of the cruise liner. And they pulled up and they advertised they were going on a, uh, a reef dive, sorry, a wall dive where there were sharks. And uh, she was like, yeah, great. I want to see this because the sharks are there and it's not going to be that dangerous because they wouldn't put us into a dangerous situation. Other people were like, oh, sharks, dangerous, don't want to go there. Now, because she was naive and she didn't understand what was going on, they end up going one of her first dives as a, an open water diver. Um, where in fact, it was more like a discover scuba diver because she wasn't certified at this stage. Um, they ended up at 30 meters, 100 feet on with her guide looking out for her. And she was off her face on narcosis. And she's sitting there going, and, and her guide is saying, like, let's go up. Yeah. And, and she was oblivious to the environment she was in. They were on a wall that was between 80 and 100 meters down. And she got no idea how to manage what was going on. So her perception was about sharks aren't going to be dangerous but she didn't understand the risk of the environment that she was in so that that naivety comes into something called the dunning kruger effect you don't know what you don't know and this is a title of a presentation i gave for um uh, tech dive 16 about being incompetent and unaware and and the idea behind dunning kruger's research was that we don't know what we don't know. And even worse, we don't know that we don't know. So what they did is they, they got some people, they looked at how good they were at maths, how good they were at spelling, grammar, humor, logic. And then they ran some tests. And when the tests were finished, they asked people, how well did you think you did? So the solid lines that are across the screen, this is their perception their, you know, their perception of their ability and their perceived test score. So in the order of 60 to 70 percent or 50 to 75, 80 percent, that sort of uh, area. Now, the gray line is what they actually scored. So these people down here were averaging around 15 percent in their exam thought they were scoring in the order of 50 to 70 percent. Um, so they didn't realize they were so poor. The other side of it was those who were good didn't realize how good they were. They underestimated their capabilities. And the other piece that came out of Dunning and Kruger's work was the fact that those who were competent 
couldn't understand why those who were incompetent were so stupid because they look on and they go, but that's obvious why that would be the case. And yet it's not. So everybody, when you're operating in a new or a, a topic that you don't understand, suffers from the Dunning-Kruger effect. It is much better to go in there and say, I don't know, how do I learn, than saying, I know this and I can solve the problems. Um, and if you've been taught by an instructor who's always about building you up and you know this and you know the, the overconfidence that comes into this, it's not going to help when it comes to problem solving. Now, within our own um, sort of operations, when we go diving, we, we have an idea of what we're trying to do and we're balancing money, time, safety, the pressures that are there. And this again comes from another sort of presentation I've done elsewhere. This dot in the middle is where we are. This is unsafety, this is unsafety, and this, well, this is, we fail because we haven't got enough people to do what we need to do. We, we run out of capacity. This is we fail because we run out of money. And this, we fail because we've had an accident. And where we are in this, po this center point is there a constant tension to basically how much am I gonna spend in time or money to get stuff done? From a, a dive center's point of view, how much, how many people do you have to do a task? And what you try, what what's happening is you're moving towards unsafety by moving the dot this way to try and get away from um, the, the sort of failures elsewhere. And then we have sort of safety programs that say, no, we, we're gonna push you back. Now, these dots, dot move around the place and this is where we end up with high reliability teams and high performance teams they cluster around their own performance and that's where they're sort of where you want to be this is your maximum bang for buck it's as you're eroding the safety margins as much as you can and you are really behaving well but actually, what happens in the reality of, of situations, we don't necessarily behave how we're supposed to. And so these black dots are where we end up having low reliability. So there's drift, there's standards aren't followed. And, and it means that you could end up getting much closer to the failure line, which is this dot, this is this line over here. We don't know where the accident line is, because if we did, we wouldn't do that activity. We don't have a crystal ball that is 100% perfect in terms of um, its accuracy. So we, we make stuff up. Now, if you want to look into this in a lot more detail, this sort of uncertainty area, I can recommend this book from Gert, 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 Gert uh, looking at risk savvy. And what he's talking about this whole bit is the emotions and the almost illogical decisions that we make. Um, and he talks about this in using lots of different examples, primarily healthcare, but it also works in the diving environment. So one of the key themes to talk about is this zero risk illusion. If we deal with big numbers, we're never actually going to be in a risky situation. So I, I said earlier that the, the risk of a fatality in diving is about one in 200,000 dives. Well, I am never going to make 200,000 dives in my lifetime. Therefore, I am not going to have a fatal event. Now, people would go, well, that's stupid thinking about that because that's that's completely logical. But our brains are illogical when we're dealing with emotions. So that's one of the things. If we deal with big numbers, we believe they won't happen to us. Um, the longer that something happens, the more certain we become that it is certain. So this is known as the turkey illusion because if you take, well, actually, it's very timely. We're dealing with Thanksgiving in the States uh, this weekend. And what we've got here is turkeys, say, 100 days ago. I don't know how long they live for, actually. But, you know, you call it 100 days. On day one, they don't know what's going on. And, hey, life is good. Day two, they get given corn. Day three, they get given corn. And each time that happens, it increases the certainty that life is good until the morning of their slaughter when it all goes horribly wrong for them. Um, so we have these same problems in diving. I'm gonna say problems because it, it lulls us into a false sense of security that we, we haven't had a bad outcome, therefore it must be okay. And this is how we move from uncertainty to risk 
to certainty and the different sort of scenarios that Gerd talks about in the book where we are moving. And so what I'm trying to get people to think about is instead of managing risk, try to manage certainty or uncertainty. Try to make things as certain as possible. Now, unfortunately, there are a number of things that limit us in, in terms of paying attention, the vigilance that's there. It's very difficult to pay attention to stuff that's going on. You only see those things that you're expecting to see. In this case, the guy was focused on that beer can and wasn't aware in timeliness that, of that pillar that was in place. Now, you could look at this and go, well, that's just stupid. He should have just paid attention. What were they doing that for anyway? Um, well, he was a pretty competent weightboarder. He wasn't uh, stupid. He just hadn't realized the significance of that pillar. And then when somebody threw the beer can, that took the attention. Now, in hindsight, we can see that's obvious. In real time, that's not necessarily the case. So we also have limitations in terms of our decision making. We have system one and system two. System one is this fast, intuitive, heuristic, mental shortcut uh, view of the world, which might be how you looked at that previous wakeboarding event where you sit there and go, mm, stupid. That was an immediate response based on previous pattern matching. And then we have system two, which is about slow decision making, where we engage our brains, we think logically, but that takes lots of energy and we don't like that. We want to be as efficient as possible. We then have another way of making decisions called naturalistic decision making. And this is where we build up lots of mental models and experience to say, this is what's likely to happen next. And we have a term called satisficing. It's good enough. Um, when fire and where this came from was originally from a guy called Gary Klein and his research team looking at how did fire chiefs and military commanders make decisions in uncertainty with limited time. And, and those those uh, fire chiefs and military officers would say, well, we just we, we follow the rules and we, we had experience. And they say, well, where's the rule book? Well, it's not sort of written down. It's, it's developed over time. And so afterwards, what he realized is speaking to those guys, they would do a debrief after each of the fires, after the military tasks. They'd sit down and they'd talk through what they saw, what they heard, what they smelled, what they what they tasted. All of those sensory inputs helped them build a mental model about what was going on. And the more mental models we have, the easier it is to make a, a more correct decision. Those models are based around experience and feedback. And it's diversity of experience, not doing the same dive a thousand times. Great, I've got a thousand dives. Where have you been? There. Okay, you're going to be very good at that. But if I put you in a different environment with different people or different problems, then actually we're going to struggle with trying to solve those problems. So that's one of the key things I would say is build experience across different areas, different problem solving. So that helps you manage the different, I'm going to say, uncertainties that are out there. Now, our brains are wired for shortcuts. Biases are seen as a, as a negative thing, and yet they're essential for how we are getting our um, tasks done. They are the mental shortcuts that allow us to operate as quickly as possible or as quick as we do. Um, these are just some of the examples. And just as, a, as a, a straight example of a bias, when it comes to uncertainty or risk, the threat from nuclear power, that's a pick three mile island, which until I started doing research in this, I thought there were a whole bunch of people killed. Nobody died in the Three Mile Island uh, nuclear accident. Um, sharks, there is this perception which is um, reinforced by the media that sharks are dangerous and we're in shark infested waters. Well, hang on a minute. We don't criticize somebody, well, sorry, we criticize somebody. We don't criticize the lion. You know, if somebody's walking through the savannah, uh, just put shorts, T-shirt and a pair of flip flops and they get mauled by a lion. We don't blame the lion for doing that. And yet when we're in the aquatic environment and the shark attacks or in fact is normally mouthing to find out what's there, we, we have a go at the sharks or the, the media does. 
but we wouldn't do the same thing for for, for lions another bit is you know the perception of how safe general aviation is in the states there are between three and four hundred fatalities every year flying light aircraft in the states now that is the equivalent of three or four regional jets an airbus 319 crashing every year in the states now if you crash three civil airliners in a year there'd be an outcry they'll be like what is going on but because these are ones and twos we never actually see the significance of what's going on and the same thing happens in diving there's a recency and recall bias we don't hear about things therefore we don't talk about them and we'll and i've talked in the past about trying to improve that reporting and that's some ongoing study now we talk about intuition as a way of um trying to make those decisions oh yeah it, it, it was a great i knew that that was the right thing to do and you go based on what oh intuition it was it was that gut feeling that it was the right thing to do and yet Kahneman, who's high behind thinking fast and slow and won the nobel prize for economics based on his work on behavioral economics showed that that's not the case um intuition is is not reliable confidence is no indicator of success and competence he said that intuition can only be correct if there's regularity in your world so you do things lots and lots and you build um, reliable mental models not just one-offs um, and that relies on you doing lots of practice and getting immediate feedback so you know that that was the the right thing otherwise we just make stuff up one of the ways that we manage those that complex world is we fill gaps from previous experiences to what's going on now. And they may be completely flawed on what's happening. That risk that we're talking about, so we've got these biases and they're saying, look, that's dangerous or it's hazardous and we're trying to work it out. But we're having to deal with everything else that goes on. Our own equipment, servicing it, money, time, weather, um, the relationships that we've got, how much... You know, if you're working in a dive center, how many people you've got? What's their competency? How much can you pay them? How much is the public going to pay? All of those are pushing the, the, the performance point towards unsafety. And you try and manage that by pushing it back. So there's always a tension that exists. It's not right or wrong. Um, it's wrong if it goes over this line, which is where we have an accident. But we're always in this tension trying to manage things as good as we can. And most of the time things go right now how do we manage that risk in a traditional way a sort of logical approach if anybody's been involved in project management or any sort of risk management activity these sorts of um, grids risk matrices are not uh, or, or should be familiar to you and, and you what you do is you look at the likelihood and you you have some definition of one to five and the consequences, you have some definition and you say, yeah, it's a it's a six or it's a nine. And, and therefore, it sits in this area. And if it ends up in a red, oh, we've got to do something to try and bring it down. Now, these matrices don't exist in isolation. They they run in parallel with other risks that you're trying to manage. And one of the questions that I always pose when I go into high risk industries is how many greens make a red? Because you might have some of these that are stacked up that individually, these are sixes or they're eights, and you're, you're happy to say that's a green. But what about the cascading effect? These risk matrices should be used to rate and prioritize risks, not to say whether or not something is acceptable or not. It's about a, a ranking process. Now, that's the logical way of, of managing risk, but we've already said that it doesn't really follow those probabilities because what we're doing is we're dealing with lots of uncertainties. And especially when we're in diving, we've got lots of things going on. And you could say that actually we're gambling and people go, well, I've got more control than that. I, you know, I know that I can do certain things to control. I can prevent, I can control or mitigate the risks that are out there. And what I'm going to show you over this next series of slides is how we can be lulled into a false sense of security, even when we've got known values that we're dealing with. Now, for a, a single dice, single die, 
we could only have six outcomes. And as long as we had a, a fair dice, if we rolled them multiple times, we'd just get a flat distribution of one to six. Now, if we roll two dice, what we have is a slightly different distribution because the number seven, so number two and 12, there's only a one in 36 chance of that happening just because they're the only opportunities to get, you know, you can have two ones or two sixes. Um, if we have the seven, if we're saying, right, what's the chances of rolling a seven? It's six in 36 or one in six outcomes. And if you go to a casino, they won't normally allow you to bet on the number seven because the house always wins. Um, so just think about how they manage their risk to make sure they don't lose money. Now, we as divers are, are dealing with small numbers of dives, 50, 100, 500. Um, it's unusual to get lots of dives that are out there. So what we're going to look at now is what happens when we look at small numbers compared to large numbers of dives, or in this case, the number of times the dice is rolled. And this is a dice rolling simulator and I've just created a little video and what happens is you click one and it rolls it and you click it again and it rolls it again and what happens is I basically click these 10 times and you get a distribution so if I then say that is over 10 dives these are the sorts of outcomes I might have and, and those range from really good outcome to I've had a, a disastrous dive. So, but if I roll those with three different people, I've got three different experiences. And so individually, I'm not going to get a good idea of what's going to happen. You know, I, I've got an, an idea based on my dive rolling. But what if we shared those experiences? I could learn. So for the third diver, uh, I, there isn't much in there is sorry there's four and fives scoring there but the first diver doesn't have any at all so there's some stuff that happened on that third dive as dives that didn't on the first one um, that so 10 dives we've got a sort of a, a, a smattering of uh, things that are going on now if we do 100 dives well this is a bit closer to a normal distribution where we had those dice that were going on seven would be the most prevalent um, one and 12 would be the least, but we've still got some oddities. You know, 11 has only got one where it should have, or if you look at five, look at two, it's got five. This is what happens if you took three dice, three sets of dice, and you rolled them um, 10 times, or sorry, 100 times. They're not the same, but you've still got a general distribution about what's happening. But what happens if we did 10,000? Well, that's still a, you know, it's it's a good distribution that we're talking about. And that's part of the problem that we have when we're trying to manage risks. At an organizational level, it's being done in a numbers point of view. So diving, one in 200,000 dives ends up as a fatality. Statistically, it's pretty safe. But what about me as an individual? I am part of that data somewhere. And in diving, we're riling way more than two dice. We've got lots of variables out there. And this is just from decompression sickness. And this is uh, Neil Pollock's presentation of, you know, what leads to decompression sickness. There's loads of stuff out there. Um, and many of them we have no real knowledge of internally. So genetics or epigenetics, um, about nutrition or drugs. Um, does sex have an in, um, uh, impact on it? What about dehydration? The value, you know, how dehydrated do you have to be to have a factor that is noticeable? Because they've also shown that if you are overhydrated, you're likely to be susceptible to immersion pulmonary edema. So there's a sweet spot that we don't actually know what it is. So trying to get these concepts across of risk and uncertainty is not easy when we're dealing with all of these things. And how we communicate that is also really important. And there's a website here, Probability Survey, which is where this, this data comes from. And people were asked to put a numerical value against the, the words that were shown. So probably or likely or 
unlikely. So probably not range from 10% through to 50%. Well, that doesn't really help us. And the problem is we want to take mental shortcuts. We want to simplify things. Um, and that's that makes it difficult to get the point across. So what we're trying to do or what I'm trying to educate is let's increase the certainty. Because if I go to this next slide, what's the possibility of all of these? If you go diving, the possibility is 100%. But what about the probability? I don't know what those numbers are. DCS, there are so many variables. Fatality, I've talked about one in 200,000. But that's across a huge population. What about, you know, you could say rebreather divers in the last 20 years. What's the probability of that? I don't know. Totally running out of gas. There's all of these things that are out there we just don't know. And then we turn around and go, what's an acceptable level? And this becomes really difficult, especially when we're talking about organizations saying, this is how training should be done. This is how we're going to manage the uncertainty or the hazard, both in terms of controlling the risk and mitigating it if it goes wrong. Now, this quote from a, a colleague of mine, the job of any human is to be able to predict with 100% accuracy what's going to happen next. Sadly, though, this is an utterly impossible task. So instead, the human has to make a probability possibility trade off where they gamble on the million and one things that can possibly happen against the one or two things that will probably happen next. And that, going back to a point that Yakov made earlier on, is about experience and knowledge that helps you understand that perception of the risks that you're facing. Now, in this photo in the background, the guy on the right hand side dropped about 15 grand worth of camera gear in this dive site. And um, he wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, it was neutrally buoyant on the surface or a little. And then for some reason, in fact, know what happened is the bubbles came up from underneath, changed the density of the water in which the camera was sitting and it sank. And then once it sank, the neoprene covers that were on it were enough to compress and then the, the camera then accelerated down. He hadn't noticed that this had gone missing. And in the background here, this is a hydrogen sulfide layer in Angelita, a, a cenote in Mexico. Um, that camera then hit this halocline area, at the um, mixture of salt and fresh water. And that is where the camera then became neutrally buoyant in the halocline layer hydrogen sulfide layer where visibility was about 30 centimeters. So I was on a, we, what was supposed to be a photo shoot dive turned into a search and recovery dive, which we knocked on after a while. Um, and then this guy spent the following die, day, about five hours trying to find this camera. And by luck, he bumped into it. As he's swimming around in this zero visibility, his arm touched something and he grabbed it and it was the camera. So massively lucky uh, to have found it, but he hadn't thought about the possibility of bubbled water coming up and changing the water density leading to the, uh, the camera sinking. Now, as, as we experience things, we have some feedback. We, we find out whether or not things go right or wrong and we adjust our behavior accordingly. And this human, human behavior so fun, is a function of the system is something called Lewin's equation. It's our behavior is a function of the person in the system and how that adjusts is based on feedback. So we have a probability of an adverse event. It doesn't matter what the number is. We have no accident. So that probability is, is still there. You know, it might be one in 10,000 events. We have something, but no accident is an outcome because it basically said nothing went wrong. So the consequence was, cool, we carry on doing what we did, and that reinforces the, the, the actions that were there. So some people talk about this as complacency. You can also talk about it as efficiency. And this is this normalization of deviance or something called risk homeostasis. We change our behaviors to maintain the same level of perceived risk. And what happens is we move, we stitch this line, between one and two and three, what happens is here, there's the standard. That's the, <gasps> that went wrong. 
and we go back and we change our behaviors and we stitch one, two, three all the time we're, because we're playing on this boundary between an accident happening and balance money and time. Now, when things don't happen, we don't have those safe, scary moments. What happens is we drift a little bit further and we eat into the safety margins. And when we don't have a bad outcome, we still think we're safe. And what's happened now is we reset this line as what is an acceptable behavior. That is what normalization of deviance is. It's continual steps that are moving on to get to things. It's, we, it's not that somebody has ignored it. It's because it's consciously we're moving on and we're getting things done without adverse events. Um, so we can have many years without things going wrong. How many times have you had something, you've done something, hasn't changed, then all of a sudden, out of the blue, something has gone wrong? I think it happens a lot, but we don't report about these things because we don't have a good reporting culture. Now, if we go the other way, so we do have an adverse event, then we also have to look at what's the probability of the severity. So you could end up with a running out of gas at depth. Now, you can bolt to the surface. Um, you could get to your next, next gas switch and try and breathe that. Um, you might end up, if you bolt to the surface, you might not have decompression sickness. You might do you might end up dead. Um, and so that consequence we have then changes our behaviors. I, I have a strong theory that the more emotionally attached you are to an adverse event, the more that there is an impact on your behavior. If it happens to your first degree of network, your first um, level of, of contacts, it will probably change your behavior as well. If it happens to your second or third tier, that sort of degrees of freedom, well, that would happen to me. I, I, I don't behave that way. Um, I wouldn't make that mistake. I'm more um, alert than those people. I'm able to pay more attention. Now, that is a poor way of thinking about things. What we have to recognize is that they are human too. And their brains and their behaviors are wired broadly the same way as mine. And that's a huge step to take is saying, if somebody else has made a failure in one way, why can't I? Now, there are examples of that feedback changing behaviors. And when I put this presentation together the first time or similar to someone to this, I spoke to Becky Kagan Schott, who's just done some fantastic stuff in the Arctic, uh, in icebergs. And um, so I, I spoke to her about this and she said, actually following two fatalities of colleagues who were very similar age. So Agnes Milauka uh, died in a cave diving uh, accident in Australia. And she, I remember seeing her in, I think 2012 or 14 at Eurotech giving a presentation. Fantastically motivated individual to do stuff. And another fatality of Yasuka Okada, uh, the two at the bottom. And Becky said, actually those two fatalities changed how she went about how she was diving um and it was a big a big shock to her because she was like yeah i can do this and then went oh hang on a minute they were both 29 and becky was 29 at the time and the images on the right hand side are the one on the bottom is a guy called steve cheshire who died on a, a 60 meter 200 foot dive to recover an artifact a big anchor and he went from they had a about a 25, 30 minute bottom time. He was breathing almost air and did a rapid ascent. Uh, did 100 and, 120 seconds to cover that 60 meter, 200 feet. Um, massive embolisms and died uh, pretty much on the boat. Now, the boat, the, the, the operator, um, a, a similar operator in the area decided that they were going to stop doing deep air. So anything below 40 meters was banned on their boat. You had to be on Trimix. And there was a checking of gas to make sure it was happening. So the sort of the silver lining to the cloud of, of Steve's demise was the fact that actually it brought a whole bunch of stuff together. And those, and people said, well, Smudge, you're gonna lose business if you limit people diving Trimix below 40 meters. It didn't make a difference. And in fact, people went to them because they went, you know what? That's a safe operator. And so you can shift behaviors.
What we have to recognize is that we're all hinds we have hindsight bias and we have to work really hard after an event to not jump into that. And, and Colin, early on, when I talked about my uh, event out in Malta, he went, let's look for the counterfactuals. Should have, could have, would have. If you see that sort of thing, that's about hindsight bias and you're telling a story that did not exist. If you want to really improve things, you've got to understand that local rationality. And that can help us improve our own certainties and manage risk and uncertainty later on. And this quote from um, one of the Queen's Council, a very senior judge in the UK, there is almost no human action or decision that cannot be made to look flawed and less sensible in the misleading light of hindsight. It is essential that the critic should keep himself constantly aware of that fact. Think about most people do not get up in the morning and say, today is a great day to get bent, to damage some equipment, to injure a student, to, to have a student die, to kill themselves. Whatever they're doing must make sense. And unfortunately, Western cultures are really geared towards, I would have done something different and look for blame. And that's not necessarily the case. We have 100% certainty after the event. Let's look at how do we increase the certainty prior to the activities that we're doing. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll leave this one out because what we're trying to do is minimize uncertainty by doing certain things. So this is a um, the image where I talked about those dots um, and high performance, high reliability teams and organizations. What we're trying to do is be here. You, this is the, the sort of the error margin that we're dealing with. And what we want to do is sit just inside that. And that's what, you know, effective explorers do. They're managing this boundary as close as possible. What we don't want is unreliability. We have lots of diversity in procedures and protocols and standards. So this is how you can maximize certainty or minimize uncertainty, depending on how you're looking at it. So put standard protocols and procedures in place. Make sure they're sensible. Make sure that they can be followed. Otherwise, you end up with meaningless compliance. Um, look at debriefs. Look at the activity that you have just done and look at what went well and why, what do we need to improve on and how. And of those four questions, the why it went well and the how to improve are the most important. Observations of things going wrong, dead easy. You can, you know, you can start picking those apart. What we have to do is dig into the why and then we can start correcting those using checklists the you know people just talk about there's not enough time to run a checklist you know it slows down that is the point of a checklist and i know that colin who's just done some training with me and so did b earlier on in this month um you can end up with situations where checklists are rubbish and, and the ones that those two were, were in training with me were designed to be rubbish and force people to make errors so checklists need to be designed well and they need to sit in a uh, and an environment that facilitates them. Telling stories. The books like this one of Under Pressure and um, my copy of Close Calls, which is on another part that's over there, um, is this bit that's telling context-rich stories that allow people to say, this is how it made sense. Look at the conditions and try and change those. All about increasing certainty. Now, I'm going to go back to that early slide, medical insurance. This is about the ability to mitigate the effects of go at something going wrong. Make sure that just because you've got medical insurance, you recognize that it's not going to give you an immediate resolution to the problem. Those who are operating in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, if you're on a boat that's 36 hours offshore and you have a serious event, no matter how much medical insurance you've got, they don't have a teleport that gets you from there to the medical facility. So whilst the insurance will pay your bills and will probably help with some of the, um, the transportation to a medical facility, think about the fact that that's going to take some time. So you might want to back off the, the risk factor so that you are unlikely to end up with uh, an, a medical injury. 
or you put your chamber on your boat, which is the other way of doing it. And the final piece I would say is about this life insurance and income protection. And when I spoke to, I've got a slide, the next slide just talk about the sort of numbers that are involved. When I spoke to these guys at the insurance company, they said, you know, people are worried about life insurance when they go diving in case something goes wrong and they've got some cover for their family when, when that happens. Well, what happens if you get hit by a bus? Do you have life insurance to cover being hit by a bus? Because if you don't, then actually your, your family are in just the same situation. So don't just focus on the diving risks that are out there and, and the potential negative outcomes. Think about life as well, normal life. And so the, the sort of numbers that this company we're talking about, Scuba Financial Services, um, it's this PM is per mil or per thousand. So what we're talking about here is, well, one per mil, one pound per mil for a hundred thousand pound cover costs you a hundred pounds a year. Two hundred thousand would be two hundred pounds a year. Three hundred thousand, three hundred a year. My family have got two sets. So I've got half a million pounds worth of cover because I'm the breadwinner and I've got three kids. I've got a mortgage here. That's what needs to be covered. Well, that's a lot of money. Yeah, okay, well, that's the cost of the sport. It's much better to be in that situation than if I don't have that cover and my wife and kids have got no money and they've got no home. So think about that. Also, think about this now. If you're a young diver in your 20s, late teens, 20s, that sort of age group, get life insurance now because most companies will take the fact that you evolved your life and they will keep the cover broadly the same. If you are 50, you started to take rebreather diving up and do rec penetration and, and you're an instructor on rebreather and you start to apply life insurance the first time, it's going to be really difficult. And now you're going to have to make a real genuine conversation with, some, with your partner, those who are, I'm going to say, stakeholders in your life. Make sure they're happy with what's going on. So I go back to this bit about managing certainty and, and safety in general. Look at how you could build barriers and defenses so that you're increasing the certainty all the time. You're reducing the uncertainty. You're making it more likely that something is going to go right the first time all the time. So human factors, designing systems so that it's easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. And then on the other side, is the mitigations that are associated with that because you know what we're dealing with people who are variable in their performance we will do things wrong just because we can't be perfect we're never going to be perfect so assume the probability of the event is one it has happened how are you going to manage that now from my side and i know beatrice is on here as, as one of the other instructors in the human diver what we do is help you manage, in effect, the cognitive element, the stuff that sits between your ears and how you interact as individuals. And that's about situation awareness, decision-making, communications, teamwork, leadership and followership, creating a psychologically safe environment so we can question and challenge what's going on and creating a just culture so we can learn from those events. Um, there's a book there's on the human diver, there's lots of stuff there. There's self-paced learning. There's webinar series that starts in January. The face-to-face -face classes, I'm about to put the remainder or the other, the next six classes up. So there's 25 classes scheduled at the moment for next year face-to-face. Um, -face. And there, there will be more as we start building that program. Um, and South Africa is in a great situation. I know this is hosted by Morning in South Africa. Um, it's a great position because it's whilst it's a 12 hour flight, it's no time zone difference. So it's uh, it's pretty good in that sense. Although we do deliver training across the globe. Um, and that leads me to the final slide about questions. And I'll see what's there. So I'm going to stop the sharing. In fact, there you go. Uh, remove from stream and go from there. So. Uh, Excellent. Thank you, Colin, for that recommendation. It's um, it's great fun. I love it. Um, and Jakob, 
risks need to be rated, and I'm guessing that was based on the um, the matrix that was there. So being arrogant when approaching the discussion is just as dangerous as a lack of experience or knowledge. Um, yes. Now, when you are in businesses and there's a commercial element, that's something that's often missed when it comes to the risk matrix is looking at that probability and consequence. We don't we don't look at the drivers for that and saying, look, you know, we, we have to do this because otherwise we, we're not commercially viable. Thanks so much, Jacob. I, I well, as you can tell, I'm passionate about this stuff and, and get the enthusiasm across. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that people will take uh, stuff away from this. Um, and I'll just quote the stuff that I write in the front of the book that knowledge is not enough. We must apply and willing is not enough. We must do. So all I would do is ask you to say, okay, what's the one key thing? There we go. Right. What's the one key thing you took from that presentation that you're going to do something with? There we go. I told you you're going to get in the keyboard and we'll see uh, what responses come back. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Jerome. So yeah, what's your one key thing that you took from that presentation that you're gonna take away and apply to your diving? And my dilemma is that I can't see Mornay anymore. <laughs> So it looks like it's just me. Which means that I can't, yeah. So Fiona, thanks for that. I mean, <laughs> excellent. All right, that's good. Um, checklists, there is a, um, I can't type this in directly, um, but if you go to the humandive.com forward slash checklists, the, um, there's a uh, webinar that I gave on that, and it gives you a lot of information. And also there's some additional resources on that page as well. And for serious about debriefs, if you do the humandiver.com forward slash debrief, there's a debrief guide that's there. Um, Gareth, just checking, can you hear me now? I can, Mornay, thank you. All right. Uh, set my own sun versus yeah. So multiple little things green can bad, add up to a big thing occurring red totally. Um, and that you know, I gave a presentation to a military conference um, to a bunch of submariners, nuclear submariners, and there were some very senior officers in the the audience who I knew some of them. And I said, okay, so we talked about this. How many greens make a red? And the look on the face of oh, well, I hadn't thought about that because they're used mm -hmm. to managing risks in isolation. Yeah. And it's really difficult to manage them as, as a complex thing. And mm -hmm. we have to use the first experience we have and not rely on just one person. That all of us is brighter than one of us. To You know, all of us together is brighter than just one. I quite like uh, this uh, comment, uh, Gareth. Um, sort of leads into what you were saying. You know, just because it works and you're used to it, it uh, doesn't mean that it's the right fix for every situation or things to come totally and and the reason why we do that we we are we have another bias the status quo bias that we want to focus on that it it, it worked the last time so we'll carry on doing it it requires mental effort to question that process to start with it requires then you can sit there going all right let's look at this mm. differently um oh hang on a minute that means that we've got to change and that again takes effort it might mm. cost us money um and then we've got other peer group going, oh, come on. We did that okay the last time. Why, why should we worry? So, mm. yeah, just yeah. agreeing, you know. So, not many questions, but more just stating um, what you said. For me, um, I enjoyed that slide. Feedback basically um, allows for change and hopefully for the better. That That was such a a great slide. Obviously, the stories behind that particular slide with two people passing away uh, mm. wasn't great, but at least, you know, um, I guess uh, well, their deaths meant something at the end of the day and, and helped others. So, great. Yeah, and I think it's that, the reflection that says, you know what, they're human, they're wired the same way as me, I could make that same mistake. 
And that is, it, it's really powerful and it's really hard because that basically yeah. means that you're vulnerable and you sit there and go, oh man, if, if I think that they could make that mistake, that means I can, I have to mm. change. But if I turn around and say, you know what, I don't behave that way, I don't let them behave like them, then I don't have to change and I don't have to apply anything. I mean, brains are fantastic at simplifying things. Uh, Philippe, yeah, be ready to accept the fact that you screwed up and draw lessons. Mm. Totally. And I, what I would ask is that when, you, when you're looking at adverse events, look at the conditions that are associated with that. So time pressures, money pressures, peer pressure, all of the things that shape our decisions, not just the decisions themselves. Because it's quite easy, just as we're talking about now, it's quite easy to discount that and say, I wouldn't make that decision. But you, you're biased by hindsight because you know what the outcome is. And so you'd sit there and go, oh, I wouldn't do that. Right, so let's look at how it developed, how it evolved. And that's not really captured in any of the diving investigation processes that happen. They, yeah. don't, they don't go far enough back. Hmm. Uh, well, um, any other questions that, that the folks have? I think there's still time to, to answer that. Yeah. Um, you know, just from my side, it's not quite Black Friday yet. You know, it seems like the world's embraced that uh, thing. But if, uh, if I can just sort of add, you know, this presentation was so great. I've been receiving WhatsApp messages from folks all around just saying, wow, awesome. So I guess, Gareth, you've given the folks that have joined uh, this evening and those that will see the replay a free gift. And let's call it your Black Friday gift to the world. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mornay. Uh, great. Harold's just posted, with regard to mitigations, should we not be screening all technical divers for a PFO? Now, interestingly, if you go and speak to the professionals, and I'm not one of those, so you speak to people like Simon Mitchell, Richard Harris, um, and I think from the uh, PFO community that's out there, the risks of doing a PFO uh, test are greater than the risks of that you would encounter on a dive. Because it actually, if 25% if of the technical diving community, as, as a general bit, have a PFO, we'd expect mm. to have more DCS events. So just mm. because you have a PFO, it doesn't mean that you're going to get bent. I mean, that, that dive that I had in Malta was about 600 dives or so, maybe a bit less, 500, I don't know, some, somewhere in hundreds of dives. And I'd had around about 50 sub 50 meter dives uh, or around that 50 meter. And then that was about my eighth or 10th um 60 plus meter dive so i had already had a significant amount of decompression exposure and i'd never had dcs hmm. so yeah that's it so um chantel uh, it's a great point not taking more and more risks because everything has always gone well always remain vigilant and be aware um as, as a way of managing that you cannot always remain vigilant Vigilance is really hard. And mm. it's why if you look at, so as a team, you can look out for each other more easily there's an, than you can as an individual. Vigilance is, is why they rotate security operators at airports when it comes to the x-ray machines, because you can't pay attention for long periods of time. Um, so looking at ways of doing things. Would you change your approach to diving you had a PFO? Um, oh, what a great question, Yakov. Mm. Um, yes, I probably would. Uh, and that would be either to go and get it fixed um, or to seriously limit my risk exposure. And that would be backing off on uh, exposure times or you know depth time uh, dosage um, or using, um, uh, well, actually, it would be that because even if you use accelerated decompression, if you miss your stops uh, for whatever reason, you're screwed. So it would be about backing off that. There's another one. Yeah, uh, a tech instructor said we're not taking a tech by student unless they were tested for a PFO at 500, five, two grand each and non medical necessity. That may be excessive. Agreed. Now, I'd be interested to in see looking at your Vegas scuba rob. Um, I'd be interested to in see whether or not that was from a liability point of view while teaching them um, mm. or whether or not it was a genuine concern for the diver. 
and their welfare. Hmm. Because risk comes across. So years ago, what, five years ago at DEMA, there was a presentation from insurance companies talking about risk. And hmm. there was a question posed about paperwork and compliance. And there was a, a comment from a panel member who said, as long as all your paperwork is complete, then you are safe. And I <laughs> went, safe from litigation or operationally safe? Because those mm -hmm. are two different concepts. Now, I get where they were coming from because it was about safe from litigation. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're operationally safe. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Some wow. good questions. Thank you very much, everybody. So, um, Gareth, um, sorry, my, I lost my um, video feed, so you can just see my little avatar there or picture of me. Uh, maybe while we wait for uh, if there are any other questions, I uh, thought maybe just to put that, um, uh, what you call it, that QR code up for folks that were maybe yeah, struggling sure, to yeah. download. I mean, we've been talking about PFOs, and... Mm. Um, let me just take that comment away so we can see it. Um, and this book, obviously, one of the chapters uh, does delve into PFOs or patent for mm -hmm. or Vales. So, uh, yeah, scan that code. Uh, it'll uh, open up your WhatsApp uh, with a pre-populated uh, message. Uh, one, uh, just add your, your name, uh, and then I'll send you a, a message with a link. And included in that message, you'll have a link to the uh, Heart and Diving a YouTube playlist available via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel. And I uh, speak under correction. I think there's something like 30 odd videos. Um, they short snippets of the different chapters and topics discussed in the uh, guide. So if you want to read it or view it, it's available either way. So yeah, quite a nice guide. Um, and I actually, Asked Dr. Cronier, the founder of Dan Southern Africa, to help me put those videos together. Um, so yeah, I think you'll uh, you'll find it to be interesting and, and nice to view and read. So yeah, all awesome. right. And so to, to thank you for that, um, Mono. That's great. You know, getting that yeah. stuff, and I've signed up for it, so it works. It's brilliant. Okay. Sit there on the screen, and, and you'll get my details in a second. Yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll, sort of, I'll, uh, I'll send it now. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, um, all right. So one of the things I was going to say, Philippe said, thanks again. Looking forward to your next webinar. And what I would say, um, I, I'm I, I'm keen to answer questions that people want. So if you've got topics that you'd like a webinar on that relates to human factors, non-technical skills, psychological safety, or just culture in diving, please get hold of Mornay with some ideas and, mm -hmm. and we can discuss about putting stuff together. Um, so, or even, or even pop them in the comments box, you know. Well, yeah, I don't know whether people can think about them on time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, so okay. that, or but, respond yeah. to the email that'll go out tomorrow morning. That that might uh, be yeah. a nice way. Yeah. Yeah. Put it put it in there. That's great. Okay. Excellent. Well, all right. Thank you well, very much, yeah. Thank you, Gareth. It was awesome. Really nice presentation. Uh, you had me glued um, from start to finish. And I mean, just looking at the comments, questions, um, uh, the, the audience obviously enjoyed it as well. So uh, from my side, this is the last one we'll host with you uh, this year. But um, if you have time between all your training and travels and so forth, it would be nice to host you yeah. again. And uh, yeah, I'll be in touch. That. And um, if we get some topics uh, that folks uh, want us to, to discuss, then I'll pass it on to you and we'll take it from there. That's awesome. awesome. Thanks very much, Mornay. I'd love to be involved. So, yes, count me in and we can get some topics sorted. All right. Okay, well, cool. shall we call it a day? Thank yeah, you very much. Cool. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And until the next one, cheers. Brilliant. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care.